I my wife this afternoon, we had a few minutes to talk, she came in late. I said, my concern is, what's going to happen to this younger generation? They're running after this preacher or that preacher, or this ministry or that ministry. When all this played out, these people are going to get hurt, and they're going to get mad at God. We're going to be sitting on his shoulder, and you know, you know he was on his job. You didn't need it. You weren't going to be holy. All the negative is going to come. And see, what happened is, you ain't got no word in here to fight what's going on up here. So, let me tell you, he's slick. And he can throw that scripture at you and turn to put just a little, little twist on it. Lord, I felt I had a goosebump. You gotta be careful with those goosebumps. They're not all from God. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to learn. I want to learn. I've been at this for thirty some years, and I'm still. You know, I've been. I don't know why people can't live. How they live without the Word of God? I don't know. It's strange to me. But anyway, go on. I've been wanting to uh, a long time. Ago. I, I I really need what you have, and I would love for you to pour it into me. We got church on Sunday morning too. I'll be. I don't. I don't Bible study is good. Sunday morning is good. Look, when I got saved, I was a womanizer, a businessman. I chased skirts. Anyone can be no faithful to no wife. I'm chief. Now my wife was a drunk. My first wife. We didn't have ever. I had my little thing going. I got my little my little toys on the side. While she's drinking her booze and somebody's trying to put the name I'm gonna talk to you street dog. Mm -hmm. So when I lost my family and I had I got money coming out of my pocket. Oh my God. I got money in the closet. Man. I got money in the safety deposit box. Yes. I got a home made for. Me. But I ain't got no more family. He talking all my business. I've been there. And then the day, what the devil? Then he turned my two, my only two sons, he turned them against me to that drunk mom. So here God, I'm desperate. My old drinking bud comes and he got saved. He said, man, you need to come to church. I said, man, I can church with something. <laughs> I said, you must be smoking something funny. Led me to the Lord. I beat everybody at that charismatic teacher's center on the university. If it started at 7 o'clock, I was in the parking lot at 6. Working like a dog all day long. Working with two hammers. No, none of that fancy tools I got today. I beat everybody. Every night they had service, I was there. And I drove 20 miles one way, 20 miles that day. I was hungry. God met me while I was. Gave me a beautiful wife, family. I can lay my head on the bed No, nobody had been there. I ain't got to worry about her being hustled by nobody. She ain't going to fall for it. That's peace. Yes, yes. You know what I'm talking about? Remember my other testimony where I told you about my phone call situation? Call me now. Uh, can't talk right now. Yes. So, man, God showed me how that was, that was an illusion, man. It wasn't even what I thought it was. Really? Yeah. I went to the bar and he showed me. That, like, like if you call my phone right now, you got a thing on the side that you can just pick up. And if your phone just in your phone, it'll send that message off. <laughs> you know the devil is notorious for blowing stuff up. It'd be like a little bitty old speck by the, by the time you get to the end of the week, it's gone. Yeah. Like a little bitty old speck by the time you get to the end of the week, it's gone. Yeah. Like a little bitty old speck by the time you get to the end of the week, it's gone. Yeah. Like a little bitty old speck by the time you get to the end of the week, it's gone. Yeah. Like a little bitty old speck by the time you get to the end of the week, it's gone. Yeah. Like a little bitty old speck by the time you get to the end of the week, it's gone. Yeah. Like a little bitty Am I talking? Oh, Jesus. Stop, 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 stop. Let me have you, bro. Let's give him some word tonight. Oh, hey! Oh, hey! Bless the Lord. Hey, Brother John. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Good? Yeah. All right, let's get started. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 has a lot of stuff in it. In it. A lot of preachers I know like to use that for end time messages. But in Matthew 24, 32, we're going to talk about parable number 8 tonight. It reads in the King James, says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and
and 44 leaves, you know that the summer is not. Now Jesus is talking in red letters. And so he's trying to convert this message, convey this message to his disciples. And his disciples, because he's reading this to them, Jesus warns them, if you'll go up to verse 11, then we'll get back to the fig tree. So you'll have a little bit of historical understanding of what's happening. Because Matthew 24 has a lot of end time connotations to it. But now Jesus, now you got to love the Lord the way he, he talked because if anybody can rap, Jesus can rap. Amen. I mean, he's the man, he knows exactly how you made, what you build, how you think. So there's been a lot of uh, discrepancy, there's been a lot of divisions among them. And we're going to find a setting here on verse 11. And here's Jesus talking and he says, And many false prophets, now that word prophet is not by itself. It's, and many false apostles and prophets shall rise. Now he tells them they're coming. And shall deceive how many? many. He said, didn't say how many, but he said many. Now if you buy YouTube tonight, this is what I want you to hear. There is an influx of apostles and prophets in the land today. And thank God the church is beginning to recognize the true apostles and true prophets. But there are as many flakes as there are true ones. On. Now Jesus is going to begin to take this and he says, and because, verse 12, iniquity, that means people who are lawless, don't follow the word of God, don't follow the law, shall abound the love of many, shall wax cold. But he, now he gives them a little bit of encouragement. He said, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That word is sozo. S-O-Z-O means saved and delivered. Then he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all world for a witness unto all nations and all people. And then shall the end come. Verse 15, And when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, who so read it, let him understand. Now, I want to stop there for a minute. In Matthew 24, let's go to verse 1. Get a little more history, so I'm going to build this, so when we get to the fig tree, you're going to have a greater understanding and knowledge of why Jesus took all this time to talk to them about a fig tree. Amen. And because the fig tree is symbolic of not the Christian church, it's symbolic of the Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. Everybody understand that? And so when he walked up to the tree and, and Peter and the water and said, Hey Lord, remember that, that tree you cursed yesterday? And I walked by that today, it's dead. It's withered. What he was doing was pronouncing over them that because they were not fruitful in the things of God, and so he came to the fig tree, and the Bible said they had fig, but they weren't ripe. And he was hungry. So, in symbolism, that means when Jesus comes to you and to me as a nation, as an individual, he wants to find fruits on you because you are a tree of righteousness. He doesn't want to find ungodly fruits. He wants to find kingdom fruits in your life. So in Matthew 24, 1, we see Jesus leaves the temple. That is the temple of Jerusalem. Then he came his disciples, the learners, the pupils. In verse 2, it says, The scribes said unto the Pharisees, Sit in the sea, and therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not you after their what? Works, for they say and they do not. So now he's beginning to tell them, I don't want you to be religious. I don't want you to just talk to talk. I want you to walk to walk. Amen. Because it's easy to talk to talk. Mm -hmm. And you know how we are, since we're just brothers here. It's easy for us just to put it out there. Yeah, yeah. But it's something else for us to live in. 
And so now he's bringing this thing uh, to an understanding. For they find heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and they lay on them men's shoulders, but they themselves, oh, I'm sorry, I am reading the wrong verse. But we'll, we'll continue with it. And they themselves uh, on the shoulders will not move them with one of their fingers. So let's transfer that now, that thought to verse 1 in chapter 24. I was in chapter 23. And Jesus went out and departed, but it ties in. See, every chapter ties into the other. It, it's not one set chapter and it, uh, something didn't happen for the next 40 years. It just kind of ties all in. It's intertwined. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, which is Jerusalem, and his disciples came to him for two, showed the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say to you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Got it. Verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man, what? Deceive. Deceive, Deceive you. Now, for as many shall come in my name, say, I am Christ. Jesus. Or, let's put it in today's layman term. I am the anointed one. We see the religious sect of one of the greatest religions in the world who has just elected a, a great official and, you know, they like to call himself, I am the Son of God, I am anointed. He, he has these big religions. So, Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Let me catch my breath and say, this is where I think the church is confused because they follow everybody's teaching on eschatology. That means end time. Apocalypse. They have no idea who is telling the truth or not. Because it sounds good. Mm -hmm. And every man gives his explanation of how he believes this is going to happen. The truth be known is none of them know when it's going to happen. But only Jesus knows when it's going to happen. But he gives us some ideas here. He says from verse 7, For nations shall rise against nations. Are we seeing that man? Yes, and kingdom against kingdom. And, and we've seen that now. The right. kingdom of darkness are fighting against the kingdom of light. Right. And there shall be famine. We know there's famine. There's pestilence. There's earthquake. I mean, look at the weather pattern. It's absolutely crazy. And divers play. And these are the beginning. Everybody say beginning. The beginning. beginning of sorrow. So. Anytime a woman is going to give birth. One of the first signs of her getting ready to deliver is her water breaks. Amen. Right? Amen. And then her contraction began to be a little bit closer. Listen to what he says. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I have never seen so much calamity and, and strife and arguing among church leadership as we're having today. Instead of being one, we are so divided and everybody stands on the street corner somewhere his little church and says, I'm right, I got all the truth. If you want the truth, you come to me. All right. Watch what he says. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. When he talks about iniquity, he's talking about the lawlessness of a man's heart. So, in 2 Corinthians, turn with me, Paul gives the church at Corinth an understanding, and it's imperative that I use this of uh, false apostles and prophets because. Uh, <laughs> let, let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff being taught that don't need to be taught, brought in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't have any problems with prayer shawls. I have one. Uh, I like blowing the shofar because I'm a top of trumpet for the Lord. But uh, I don't think I'm, I have to follow 
the law to the T for God to accept it. Because he gave me another covenant. A covenant of grace and truth. But this covenant of grace is not a greasy grace. Everybody says not greasy. It's not greasy. That means if you fall short, you come short, you and you you come you, you get into sin, you repent of your sin. The grace of God did not already take care of it. He is waiting for you to repent before He takes care of it. So you still got to come to repentance. There's messages on grace all over national TV. So all you need is grace. God so loved you, so full of grace. If you commit a sin and you think about committing a sin, He already forgave you. Find that in the scripture for me. The Bible says, if you confess your sins, He is faithful, 1 John 1 9, and just to forgive you. Is that correct? That's right. Now, in 2 Corinthians 11, I want you to go to verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So I want to jot this down on the board. And the word transform. You see that word? Uh -huh. So they're going to transform. Now this is not the same kind of transform that you have in a, a transformer of a, an electrical plant where it produces electricity. This is to change. Alright? So they have the ability to change themselves into something that they are not. So what is the rest of the verses? Transform themselves into what? Somebody read. As ministers of righteousness. As ministers of what? Righteousness. Of righteousness. Is that correct? That's right. Now, if they have the ability, the false apostles and false prophets, and both of their names begin with pseudo Apollos and pseudo prophet, prophet, meaning soulish liars, deceitfulness. If they have the power to do that, where did they get this power to change? They got it from Satan. Because the Bible says Satan comes to us as, or transforms himself, as an angel of light. That's right. So, I'm going to go back, Brother Neek. So if we understand this process of transformation, and Jesus is warning his disciples all in the same discourse because he's trying to bring them to understand, to learn the parable of the fig tree. Hmm. Wow. That takes away of self-anointed, self-appointed apostles and prophets. Anybody can call him or give himself a title. I could give Brother Neil apostle this and call him apostle that. The problem with that is not because he's addressed with that office, he has to possess the gifts and talents of that office. Oh, come on now. Amen. Right. I, I ain't got a problem calling the man or woman a prophet or an apostle, but I want to see the fruits of your apostleship. Right. Come on. Because see, an apostle has the ability to govern a group of people where a prophet has the ability to guide them through whatever God is leading them to do. And so it is only the apostle and the prophet in Ephesians 2.20 that set up the foundation of the church. Everything else is given to them after that is set up. Now, Amen. saying all that, let's go back to Matthew 24. Now, it says, learn a parable of the fig tree. So I'm going to write that on the board. The first thing we want to do is to learn a parable. If you were here at the beginning, what does a parable mean? Proverb of the fig tree. 
And Proverbs are things that deal with the issues of the heart. A proverb is always something that deals with the issue of the heart. So Jesus said to the boys, learn the parable of the fig tree. So uh, to learn means to increase one's knowledge and to learn by practice. <laughs> I must say practice, practice. makes good. Makes good. Huh? Makes good. The more you practice, the better you get at it. Amen. Now, 1 wow. Thessalonians then, we'll go back to Paul's teachings as an apostle. He's instructing them at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Say amen when you get there. Amen. I'll have to say amen when I get there. I'm sure I'm trying to get there. All right, come on. My pages seem to be stuck again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look what the Bible says. What's another word for learn? How do we learn something? We study. We read the blueprint. We read the roadmaps. We, we read the instructions when we're putting something together. We, we, we learn the principles of how to do our jobs. Is that correct? We hear the word, he goes, study, a little bit different than we've heard, to be quiet. So it's not the blabbermouth that knows everything. Somebody say, man, you brothers have me. It's not the black man that knows everything. Just because he's a spokesman all the time doesn't mean he knows everything. That's right. That's right. Because the Bible talks about having a peaceful and quiet spirit. Amen. And do your own business. I mean, that also means my own business. Amen. And work with your own hands. Hands means ministry. Work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, since you're that close, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, another a son of God, a son of Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I've been printed this uh, 36 years ago. I've memorized the scripture. I can quote it to you for reading, but I want you to read it more. Because now he's talking about learning a parable of the fig tree. And he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. So who, who are you showing yourself approved to? To the preacher? No, unto God. And then he says, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, here's another word of that. Rightly discerning what you are listening to if something is sitting on your right shoulder or left shoulder or talking from behind you or talking right at you. Rightly divine the word that they're saying to you. Is it truth? How can I determine this? The proof is in the pudding. If it's truth, I'll find it in the word. Amen. So let's break it down. Approving, accepting, and pleasing to God. Workman in a laborer, a businessman in kingdom work. He's a worker in the kingdom. Then he said he needed not to be ashamed. There's never any call, brethren, to be shameful. If you don't know it, learn it. If you don't know it now, learn it. If you want to learn it, get with the program. Then he says, rightly divide them into cut straight. Smooth to have right and to teach the truth. And the word is the Logos. The speech of God's word. You read the word of God. So when he uses learn a parable, then what he is saying to us is placing one thing on the side of another. And this is all I've been doing for you in the parables. Placing one thing on the side of another. And so the fig tree, therefore, is the Jewish nation. Now, how do we fit into what Jesus is trying to teach his guys? Now he's talking to what? Jewish followers. Mm -hmm. not, huh? He ain't talking to nobody else. Because he hadn't done what he had to do yet. So he's talking to a Jewish nation. But he provided something for you and me. In Romans 11. Go to your left. Romans 11. 
And I hope tonight that I have enough time to share all these principles with you because I'd like to get them all in one CD message. So that's why I'm rushing a little bit. Romans 11. The Bible calls us in verse 17, the wild olive tree. Look at your neighbor says, I'm wild, I'm an olive, and I'm a tree. Wild, I'm an olive, and a tree. And he said that if some of the branches be broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Now he gives a warning. Verse 18. Both not against the branches. It's like if people say, man, you're not coming to our truth. Well, I'm preaching, man. My preacher, man. We got the truth in my church, brother. We got it all. No such thing. Both not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Got it? Mm -hmm. So, what he's saying to us, that in this fig tree, which was the Jewish nation, Jesus comes up with some plan for us. I want to go back to the board. Where do we fit in this plan? If we're going to learn a parable and understand it, how do we understand that? He uses the word called graph. See that word in Romans 11, 17? Y'all see that word? Yep. Now, that means to make a cut or a scission. I remember the old French people used to talk about, oh man, I want to go to Cornell's house and got some beautiful fig trees. I want to get their planting started. So I got a little something over there. My, my, my tree's not doing good, so the old men, or mostly the old men knew how it was a gift and a talent. They would take a piece of that and they would cut that branch in such a way, slice it, make an incision, and they would plant that other branch and they would graft it. They would call that graffé. And it would, when it took, you had the most gorgeous, most productive fig tree or whatever tree that you grafted in. So of our own self, because we were Gentiles and we were alienated from God according to Ephesians, God had a plan before the foundations of the world that would come up and he would give this blessing to another people. Because the Jewish people had rejected him as Messiah, they had turned their backs on him, he had all these blessings and these people even followed him. So now Paul says, I'm going to give you an understanding, you have been grafted in. You didn't get saved by family. Mm -hmm. You didn't come in here because your family got money. You didn't come in here because uh, you're of different nation, or different color. You didn't come any other way, but God granted you in. And now that everything that I gave to the Jewish nation, it is now yours. You become an inheritance of everything that I promised them. Come on. Mm. Hmm. Learn, he said. Hallelujah. Well, you ain't going to get that in Sunday school class. No. Huh. You're not going to get that on a Sunday morning uh, sermon yet. Amen. Or just let the root and, and everybody prophesy to one everybody, everybody be a happy and go home. Oh my God. Who the anointing was that? They can't tell you the, the day after what the, the, the preacher said. <laughs> Come on! Come on. Watch. We could not grant ourselves but in Christ by his blood that atoned for us to be part of the tree. We are now partakers of the root. Second Peter chapter 1. To your right, let's get, let's get to see what Apostle Peter has to say about this. We call him by that right name. Mm -hmm. Apostle Peter, chapter 2, Peter, 2 Peter, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to heaven, and delivered them into the chains of darkness, and to be reserved, um, I'm sorry, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious what? Promise. That by these you might be partakers of the what? Divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. Mm -hmm. So let's read that real slow. Whereby the parable of the fig tree are given unto us exceeding 
Not a little bit. Great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is the world through love. Now, I, I, I want, I gotta do something. I gotta do something. I gotta, I'm here no week over. Now, so we have this incision made to be grafted into the olive tree. And so, whatever anointing <laughs> was on the Jewish nation has come upon us. Amen. Now, John 10 said, if any of us come by any other way, we haven't really heard the shepherd's voice. Right? right. And so, if you have been gr grafted, now answer for me, into his anointing, what does that make you? The anointed. If you have been grafted into religion, what does that make you? Religion. Religious. And therefore, you have taken on the attitude of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and it's all about materialism and your clothes and what church you go to and how what kind of nice car you drive. Jesus. Had nothing to do with a divine nature. The nature of Christ in you. And here's where the rubber meets the road. If you have not been truly grafted in, let me put it in language. If you truly are not born again, then you can't produce good fruit. That's right. You can produce religious fruit and works. Yes. So, let's go back and see if I know what I'm talking about. He said, learn the parable of the fig tree. Mm. Now, when the branch, go back to Matthew 24, same verse 32. When the, his branch is yet tender and put it for leaf, you know that what? The summer is not. So, the second thing I want to talk about is the branch. So, we're going to write, when the branch is tender. You know what that means in the Hebrew word? No. Tender means full of sap. Sap means life. The life of God means Zoe. If you got the blood of Jesus flowing through your blood, you got life. But here's where your branch may not be tender and full of life because you don't know who you are and you're living beneath your privileges. So you just go, going through the motions, go, doing your duty, like everybody, you're more of a follower of men than you're a follower of Christ. Well, I'm not, I'll be preaching this. Day. Now, hallelujah, let's go to Genesis 1. <laughs> Look at your name and say, I'm a tree, I'm a tree, I'm a tree, I'm a tree. I'm a tree, I'm a tree, I'm a tree. I'm a tree. Let's go to the, the law first mentioned. Genesis chapter 1 in verse 11. And it says, and God said, everybody say, God said. God said. In, the in the beginning. Let the earth bring forth grass, the earth yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after it what kind? After its own kind. It didn't say after the church's kind. It didn't say after religion's kind. Whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So the seed of Christ is in the child of God that got born again, and we have, watch me now, we have become his branch. Sis. Tender. Look at me now. My branches started up here. Tender. Uh oh. And full of fat. My limbs are hanging. I'm so fruitful. I can't give enough of this stuff away. Because uh -oh. I'm full of God and not full of religion. Uh -oh. 
Uh-oh. and not for self. Uh-oh. But how did he do this? Genesis 2 9. And out of the ground, where did the tree come from? Out of the ground mm-hmm. made the Lord God to grow every tree that it is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of good and evil. Adam had no business committing treason. Hmm. But that pretty little thing got took out of his side. Oh my God. Come on. They said it wasn't the man that they fought. It was the woman. Come on. That's who told it. Now I ain't got no ladies backing me up in your time, but you see. <laughs> but then if you turn the page around, it is a whole lot easier to reach a woman than it is to reach a man with the word of God. That's right. Amen. Because they understand Amen. conception and how to produce the fruit. Amen. Mm-hmm. So true. So true. So true. So true. So true. No. Hallelujah. You see, we come from the root. The root didn't come from us. Now, go back to Romans 11. I want to show you something real quick. I want to give you six methods of how God takes us through this process that we become this grafted, wild, olive tree. Now, I'm going to give it to you one at a time. So now you know where you are, you got this outline, I'm going to erase it. Six methods. And the first method I want to show to you is called the saddle method. Romans 11 and 17 called the saddle method. And these are methods to do what? These are six methods of how God brings us through the grafted process to becoming grafted into the olive tree. That's why we refer to in the Bible as the Wild olive tree tree. A saddle is talks about individual places upon an animal in the process of being broken and after taming to continue the process. If you're familiar with breaking horses, since we have a lot of horses in our part of the country, mm-hmm. when I was a young boy, about 13, 14 years old, I broke horses. But before I could break that horse and put a saddle on it, the first thing I did was to get him used to the bridle. That uncomfortable thing in his mouth, because he was wild. He'd never been tamed. And I'd stroke him. And I'd brush him a lot. Then, the day would come, I'd just throw the sack on him. Hmm. Walk him around. Get him used to having something on his back. Mm-hmm. And then when he got used to that, I threw the saddle on him. Walk him around with the saddle, around the, the yard, born yard, just walk him around. He's still happy, man. He, you know, he, he likes that saddle. Boy, I like him now, man. But, but I, didn't, I don't like the feeling when it happened. And then comes the day of redemption. I got to get on him. And he's going to buck. And he's going to snort. And <laughs> he's going to plow. He's even going to plow and get up and I mean, I got all the apparatuses. I know how to do it. I've done it before. Mm-hmm. And so this is what happens to us. We have no idea what's going on, but Jesus knows how to put us down on our back. Come on. And the process of that, he wants to tame us. That's right. Because we have come to him as a wild over and we have a wild nature, and we're untamed. That's right. And we have no concept of what a real fig tree is. We have no concept of what kingdom is. But listen to this. Here's a spiritual concept. Come on. 
to load or encumber as with a burden. If you refuse the Sabbath, mm -hmm. come on, that you might experience, then you might experience the rod of correction. Oh my God. When he didn't like me being on that saddle, I got a little whip and go on that hind. He, he, he kicked. He got to where I don't like that. So instead of kicking, he give in. Mm -hmm. So after about a week of this, mm -hmm. every day the same process. Yeah. You know, from the bridle to the saddle to getting on there. Letting him buck, doing everything. I allow him because he, 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 the horse's mind is uncultivated. He's untamed. He doesn't know anything else but to want to run wild in the pasture. <laughs> Full steam ahead. Just like a person who got born again has no idea what has happened to him. In this process, unless we allow the graft, grafted process of God to work, we can't be productive. That means he can't break your mindset and he can't take away your old nasty mindset and give you his mind. So you have to change. So we find this principle in John 15 and 1. He, said, he is the vine. We are the branches. If we don't submit to the vine's work, we'll never be productive branches. Mm. Now I'm making this brief, alright? There's a lot you could say about the saddle. I could take you to a, a lot of different scriptures. But the next one is the splice method. You'll find this one just as interesting. Say the splice method. Splice. How splice. God splice. You ready for this? Amen. The splice method. How God in His infinite wisdom can take the Word of God, which is, let me put this up here, Hebrews 4 and 12. For the Word of God is quick and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the asunder and soul of spirit, and in a discerner cerner of the intents of the heart. The Word of God is so sharp Mm -hmm. It's a two-edged sword. Amen. When he comes to you, he cuts you on in. Just oh. like if you be on the street and the brother pulls out and he slice, you slice it. You know, if you haven't been cut with a knife, it burns. And it don't heal right away. Well, God will take the blade of his word and begin to do scission on our minds. Because when he first came in, he came in with a scission because your heart was uncircumcised. And he circumcises your heart to where your heart does not belong to anybody else. <coughs> You've totally given it all to him. And now he takes you through this process calling the splice method. But in the splice method, it's called overlapping and binding two pieces of wood together. Philippians 3 and 1 says that we are the true circumcision of God. How does this work? We are spiritually joined in marriage to unite two so we can become one. one. Amen. Unlike the yoke, an individual still has mobility. Here it becomes, you become one with God. Splicing gives us an ability to become partakers of the root. Because it is the root that produces the fruit. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. I know we say all the time, we quote the scripture, you shall know them by that fruit. You will also know by kind of root that that fruit produces the fruit. Yes, right. Amen. Amen. I had never forget when Dr. Nell, before he went to heaven, teaching a delivery seminar and we were over there on, on Law Street. This young um, woman came. I wasn't there. I had, to, I had another meeting and he was teaching a morning class. She walked into the church door and she said, I have a word from 
God. Come on. He said, well, that's wonderful. I said, I don't know. After about 15 minutes, she couldn't take it anymore. She said, I came here with a word from God. God told me to come in here and give you a word. He says, well, number one, I am not the pastor of the church. And the pastor is not with us right now. But if you want to remain till after I'm through with my lecture, I'll sit down and hear what you have to say. And then I'm going to call two or three of these brothers and we're going to judge your prophecy. She said, I don't need to be judged. I am, I am a true prophet. She said that if you are a true prophet, then you will mind your manners and you will escort yourself out of this building and you will quit interrupting my service. She picked up a book. So what kind of fruit did this woman have? Not good. Just from her outward appearance, you could tell she's demanding. She's boisterous. She's arrogant. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't understand church order. Amen. Amen. So she's been tapping into the wrong root. And that root is producing the wrong fruit. That's right. So she's one of those self-appointed, self anointed My God. <laughs> she doesn't have the fruits to bear forth of her gift. So, now, let's go to Philippians 3. You got to see this. You got to be able to see these people in action. Because, see, the Spirit has a lot of different ways of manifesting Himself, talking about the evil spirit. Paul said the first Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write this same thing to you. To me, indeed, is not good, but for you it is safe. So I'm doing this for your own good. Watch this. Beware of dogs. <laughs> you think maybe when you hear people say, hey, what's happening, dog? You know? This is not a new term. <laughs> But dogs in Scripture refer to the unregenerate, the unsaved, the uncultivated, the untamed. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So when God begins to operate this life's method in you, he will begin to give you the ability to begin to partake of the true root. And therefore, he will bring forth the true fruit. Now, quickly, the cleft method. I have never seen anybody teach on this principle like this. God gave me this by the Holy Ghost. It's a wonderful, and you can use Hebrews 4.12 edition also. The class method is to cleave and to divide. Oh. So once you have become of the tree, and you've been grafted in, God is going to begin to separate you, and He's going to begin to divide you from some of your buddies, and some of the folks you hang with. Come on. Because Come on. if they're hindering you from producing the real fruit, that's right. He is going to cut them off. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus. Now that won't make us anybody. It makes him somebody because he's in charge. Amen. Dividing by sword, by piercing. To cling means to, to glue, to adhere, to cling to God. The principle is found in Matthew 19.5. I'll, I'll write it up on the board. You got uh, Matthew 19.5. You have to leave, watch it up, to cleave. Did you find it, brother? You oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So you have to leave to cleave. Explain that to me. You're going to have to leave your father, which means, you ready for this? Let me write it on the board. Leave 
father. When Jesus talked about leaving your father, he's talk, not talking about your natural daddy. But he is talking about him if he has what? Old traditional way. We got it? Amen. Now, the next thing we see operating is to leave your mother. <laughs> Y'all enjoying this? Yes. yes. Leave mother. Here again, we're not just talking about your natural mother. We're talking about your mother being your soulish mind. Worldly thoughts. You in church, but you still think like the world. Or can I give you another one? Yes. Love and mother and father, you gotta leave the old Adamic nature. What does the old Adamic nature like to do? Sin. Fornicate. Steal. Kill. Lust. That's part of the old nature. The old Adamic nature. But 1 Corinthians 15 says that was the first Adam, but the second Adam became a quickening spirit. Christ in us, according to Colossians, is the hope of glory. I feel like I'm quoting the Bible to you. Know. It's like the hope. He is the hope, our hope of glory. Now let's go to the next one. We already had four, and we got two more. Now, the fourth method, <clears throat> bring my paper, and right over here will be lighting you and making all these tricks. <laughs> <laughs> I see you doing on TV, I guess I can do it, all right with you? Yes, sir. Amen. Bird. Everybody say, the bird method. Bird. We ain't talking about bird what? Bird method. Wow. When something is fixing to come to fruition, what is the first thing you see on the tree? Bird. A little bird. This was you. How does this operate? From inserting of a bird from one plant into the other. Huh. Anyway. Now y'all remember the little thing I did about cross pollination uh -huh. with the tree? I've been in this for a little while, but I ain't got no fruit. Well, you're hanging around with the wrong tree. How nice could you be? The binding of the little shoot is to keep predators away from, from plucking it off. Isn't that good? Let me get back here. So, the bird method. Number one, under that I mean seeded in two. How does the bird method, one bird from one plant to the other, is called, it releases its sperm. <laughs> Man, God, listen, he knows everything. Making trees cross-pollinate. Mm -hmm. Can you hear this? Having sexual intercourse. Mm. Because you you got a female tree over here and a male tree over here and she ain't producing nothing because she needs a man. She gotta have the sperm from the man because she's got the pool. So here God says, I know I can fix you up. First John three nine says, Whoever is born of God is born of his sperm. Isn't that correct? Amen. Seated by incorruptible seed. First Peter one twenty three says, There is no condemnation. That, that there is no incorruptibleness because the seed of Christ is pure. Galatians 3.16 we see the seed of promise. Two women but only one have the seed of Christ. Let me say it this way. Come on. Did I give you a scripture for that? Yes, yeah, 1 John 3.9 1 Peter 1.23. Let me write them up here. 
Galatians 3.16. 1 John 3.9, 1 Peter 1.23, 1.23, Galatians 3.16. Huh? Galatians 3.16. And Galatians 3.16. Get them all where you can. Got it. Now, we are what we eat, and we are what we say we are. Whatever we love, that's what we're going to produce. That's right. Amen. Uh, I hope I didn't lose one of my, my buddies. I think I did. Number five. I cut his head off. So I'll just give you five. Then the side method. We go with the side method. Processes were so interesting. Our position in Christ is vital to the observing world. It does not matter what other people think because we are seated with Christ, Ephesians 2, in heavenly places. Amen. And we are on the right side. Through Christ, John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followed me shall not f follow darkness. We, through Christ, have become the light of the world. And we cannot hide our light. Amen.
I was involved in a church, a real teaching church. And uh, I got involved with this little group. And I had no idea about them being self-proclaimed prophets where they prophesied this and that to the other, everybody. Or oh, the Lord said, the Lord, but 90% of that, or not 9.99% of it, the Lord did say. Yes, and so we were learning how to operate in the gifts. And so the enemy took me, I didn't leave the church. Mm -hmm. You can go to church and not be in the church. Yeah. Your heart's not there. My heart was no longer there because, man, this was nice. And they had nice looking girls. I was single. Uh, this one had her eye on me. And the, the head knocker, he, he said, uh, you know, the Lord got to save for you. And well, I'm going, whoo, I am in the right place. The Lord had mercy on me. Now, I came from a world where I liked pretty things. I had toys. I, had, I wasn't saved. I was lost. I thought, Work hard, live hard. This is the life. Play hard. Huh? And play hard. So I'm making the transference of that to a church who was supposed to be a word church, which it was. Mm -hmm. But then my eye got cast off of what was happening in the church where I needed the word to build up my faith. Mm -hmm. And I got it on this little group. And in six months time, Everything I had learned, I think it's like, come on. So here I am like a little bugger walking in church on Sunday morning. Like everybody knew what I did, knew what I did and didn't do. Like guilt was written on my forehead. I beat. And I got the Jesus that I love. And I vowed that I would serve him on the days of my life. What am I doing over here? And here come the preacher, the prophet. Got a word from God. And zeroed in on my situation. You have taken your eyes off of Jesus. You left your first love. You're following false prophets. Going to these special little meetings. Telling you, yay, yay, yay. And the Lord had not said he was reading my mail. There's over 600 people in the church. I'm sitting right smack in the middle. And I thought, if there was a hole in the floor and I was a worm, I would find that hole. But by the time he got to preaching, I had a moment to call. I'm up front that little. Man, it was hard. I got that hands up. I forced my hands up. I said, Jesus, maybe I'm talking to you tonight. Put me back where I got off and give me that fire again. Yes. I'll never turn my back on you again. Yes. I'm sorry for my sins. I've repented of my sins. And every time I got invited to another meeting, I said, no one wants it. I came. I said, I got to go home and study and pray. <laughs> I got final Saturday. I was enrolled in Bible college there. I knew God had a call in my mind. And I made him my first priority. And he gave me a wife after his own kind, his own heart, of 35 years, a good, God-fearing, healthy, vibrant woman, righteous woman. And I don't have to ever be concerned about what she does, and she didn't have to be concerned about what I do, because we have found the straight and narrow path. So tonight, when we consider this fig tree, what Jesus was doing, <laughs> he was reproving a Jewish nation. And he's letting them, I've come by this fig tree more than once. He said, now it's time for you to learn the parable of the fig tree. We're talking end times here. And he said, at the end of your journey, boys, what do you have to show for it? So you start the process now and you don't quit till you finish. So they understood this, so now the process begins. Thank God that He decided to give us an opportunity 
to get grafted into that fig tree. This is why, if you're watching by YouTube, America, congressmen and senators, and Mr. President, we cannot turn our back on Israel. It would be like cutting ourselves off. Because he that touches the apple of his eye touches him. So, tonight we will learn some stuff about the parable of the fig tree. We are the tree and the planting of the Lord. And he delights in all of us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful tonight. We thank you for your mercy, for your goodness, your kindness. We thank you, Father, as we take this word tonight and we apply it to our own hearts and lives. We pray that in a week, or two weeks, in six months, and every day of our lives, at the end of the day, we have fruit to show forth of your righteousness. We are the righteous tree because you have made us a righteous branch. And all the blessings that came upon Abraham are ours through Christ Jesus. We are the head, not the tail. We are above and not beneath. Amen. Now, Father, we ask you to stretch forth your hand and to bless those that need to be blessed. And to comfort those that need to be comforted. And to forgive those that need to be forgiven. And we release that to you tonight. And we'll give you all the praise. And all the glory. And the people of God said. Amen. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. God bless you brothers. I'm glad you came. Hope you enjoy it. What the Lord is saying to us tonight. Amen. You see the concept of learning by these parables. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't know anything about you.